um, news about uh, newsrooms downsizing or even closing down hardly make the headlines anymore. What does catch people's attention is when organizations that are not traditional media companies hire journalists. And if you look um, a month ago, over in UK, Twitter UK um, recruited a very accomplished journalist from the BBC, actually the person who was going to head up BBC's uh, coverage of the London Olympics. Um, and it was commented in the media that there was a major blow to the BBC strategy. Earlier this month, Tumblr, the social media um, site, um, went ahead and they hired their first ever editor-in-chief. So there's some really interesting uh, developments going on, but really sort of this, this sort of blend between um, PR and journalism is something that really has been going on much longer. And today with us is uh, John Earnhardt, uh, Director of Corporate Public Relations, also social media at Cisco Systems. And Cisco, as you know, um, a what, 107 billion um, or so uh, dollar um, company, uh, tech company in the Bay Area, really the backbone, the technical backbone of the internet. About 10 or over 10 years ago, they started what's now called the network. It's essentially, they um, built a new site, which is you know, something we now call corporate journalism, and uh, really spearheaded this effort and went ahead and hired a number of um, very accomplished tech journalists. And uh, John is here today to share with us um, how he and his team have uh, gone about this effort. And uh, um, we also hear a little bit from some of the journalists involved. So John, thank you very much for being here. And over to you. Great. Uh, thanks very much. So, I thought, uh, real briefly, to get a little bit of my background, um, so you can kind of see where I came from, uh, which was not journalism, other than writing my high school newspaper in, in uh, North Stanley, uh, New England, North Carolina. Um, and so that was the last uh, journalism job. Uh, I, I worked on Capitol Hill at college for Senator Biden, um, then got into um, um, the campaign world with uh, Clinton Gore in 96. And then uh, joined uh, Cisco in 99, uh, doing public PR for our CEO. Um, and then moved back in public policy. Uh, and then now I've been back in corporate um, comms for the last five years or so. Um, which may give you a little perspective of how I've kind of approached uh, our social media world as well as our um, communications uh, from a corporation standpoint. And so, BT mentioned uh, that we started the newsroom uh, back in about 2000 to create our own content. Um, the content really was focused around, yay Cisco, how great is this company, we're fantastic, look at this you know, executive, here's a Q&A with the executive, don't you want that? And we had some success because it was a different approach, but after a while, um, people really didn't want that content. And so when I took over the social media team um, in, um, just two years ago now, um, I said, okay, uh, let's let's try to do something uh, different because we do have a shifting media landscape and take some of these accomplished journalists and see if they will uh, work with us. And so that's uh, what I'll uh, talk about here. And so obviously life's about choices and uh, you know, I see a, a lot of red, I think, not necessarily because it's Valentine's Day. Um, because obviously where, 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 where I'm speaking here. Uh, but life's about choices. As I left uh, uh, my, my house this morning at 5.30 um, with a sleeping five-year-old and a sleeping wife. And so um, if you're a fan of The Simpsons, I'm happy Valentine's Day and I choose to be here rather than, you know. Uh, you're your wife. <laughs> um, so when I took over the team, uh, a little before that, my colleague and I uh, were talking about doing uh, some sort of fellowship or some sort of funding around uh, journalism that's focused on innovation. And so we tried to come up with a program that would uh, basically uh, put out proposals to say, hey, we'd love to see coverage in this, and then let people uh, pitch for ideas, and then we would award these fellowships. Um, that didn't work out. Um, we couldn't get the, the size of the funding together, and um, you know the concept was, you know, hey, this is going to be a big, you know, maybe not a Nobel, maybe not a Pulitzer, but and maybe not a ProPublica, but in that high-minded um, 
you know, way deep, in-depth coverage about innovation, which is something Cisco obviously cares very much about. And then the only thing that we would ask for is, hey, sponsored by a grant from Cisco or some whatever we worked out. And so when I took over the social media team, uh, where we had a little bit of budget for writers, um, we decided to do a little bit of a shift. And so I'm not going to read this, but the concept is, as, as uh, we were saying earlier, is that um, because we have these, these very valuable, experienced journalists who maybe took buyouts uh, from, these, from these publications, from Business Week, from Forbes, from New York Times, from Wall Street Journal, from you name it, um, and we've had relationships with them over the years, either reporting on us or just in the industry, you know, they're now available. Um, would they like to work with us? Um, would they like to uh, come to some sort of agreement uh, to do some writing about the things that we care about? And again, not raw raw Cisco stuff, uh, but to have a little bit of arm's length, if you will, about the technology areas, which is very sexy I have. Uh, about cloud computing and video collaboration and those, those business um, technologies that we really care about. And surprisingly, maybe not so surprisingly because they're available, they said yes, uh, under, under some rules and under some things that we want to obviously uh, share their credibility, obviously, because they're names in the industry and we don't want to uh, diminish that. And so, um, you know, I support journalism and can discuss uh, what that means our brand journalism, uh, but essentially we do hope and think that it can be viewed, um, and, and has been viewed by some, as it's a story. It's a good story. It's a good report, and the fact that we're sponsoring it, or that we're paying for it, um, we hope can be shifted. It's no different than NPR um, taking money to sponsor you know, environmental reporting or innovation reporting. Um, we're just funding it directly. Um, we're not ad-based. Um, uh, business. We sell routers and switches and technology that supports this model. Um, and we have a great business model. Um, advertising, uh, as we know, um, for paper um, and online is, is maybe not such a great business model. Now. And so, what's the network? Um, obviously, corporate newsroom, because we got to pay the bills. So, so, press releases, you know, B roll, media assets, so we can make these things social. Um, you know, so one of the things that we're going around with, um, which we can discuss in, in, in PR classes or not, is the concept of putting comments on press releases, which not a lot of people do, and we think that that might make, might make them a little more conversational right now. Um, many people can't understand a word that press releases say, and maybe that will help the writing uh, if, we, if we're trying to engender some sort of conversation around press releases. And so that's, that's the basics. Um, obviously, all the social. So you can share, you can put all these different um, um, different uh, social uh, buttons on there. So we want to make it engageable. And you know, earlier uh, we, were, we were talking, and it's like, you know, how do you get people to engage in content? And I joked, like, you offer something free, and then they'll do it. And to a degree, you know, that that at its base is true. And what we try to do, hopefully, um, and try to to, to uh, go after audience, is to offer something of value. And so whether that is you know, information, whether that's entertainment, whether that's something that they can take and say, you know what, I validate this by sharing this. I validate this by commenting on this. I'm going to engage in that. Um, and, you know, I joke that you know, my mom uses social media, but she, uses, she still uses uh, scissors and an envelope and a stamp, um, which is fine. It's social, uh, but this is obviously a little easier and a little, a little on the lower threshold. Um, and then also the, the stories are a big part of it. And so we have the contributing writers, and we do our own original content as well. And mainly the content that we do is video content, um, which is a little more uh, higher production. And we encourage our, all our reporters, we just hired someone from Nightly Business Report um, to uh, contribute, and hopefully we can bring some of those video skills to build fair as well. And then we curate content as well. And so what we want to say is that this is a site that, yes, you're going to get some good stories from good journalists, but if there are stories that we think you might be interested in the topics, topic areas that we're interested in, we're going to make those available as well. And those are going to send you elsewhere, and those just basically bookmarks on our site from any other outlet. And so there's a reason potentially for you, if you care about the things we care about, to come and join us on this, on this uh, community. 
So this is, gives you a little bit of metrics of, of kind of the channels we're building to amplify, to engage with all our audiences. And so obviously these numbers are growing, um, but we use it as a uh, push-pull a little bit. Obviously people voluntarily follow us, and so that's great. And we want to target uh, those influencers, if you will, that um, ultimately we are about um, selling widgets, and so we do want to, at some level, hopefully purchase, uh, have some purchase decision um, influence, but we don't track how many people we pull in to the channel. We're, we're, we know we're at the very, very top of the channel or in trying to point people. Uh, and on our website, you know, you can go into these proprietary uh, communities. Like, if you really want to talk to a Cisco engineer on this technology, you can do it, and we'll, we'll point you there. Um, but we're not you know, trying to do any metrics around that. It's just more of, hey, here's a conversation. We hope you'll, you'll uh, uh, participate. But obviously 100,000 uh, followers on Twitter, a couple hundred thousand on Facebook, where we push our content out. And so, and we ask them to engage now on that, as well as push them to the platform. And so it is a bit of an ecosystem of, you know, push-pull. We, we put different content on LinkedIn than we might put on Facebook. Facebook's very consumer, uh, very student, uh, very international. LinkedIn is definitely a little more professional. Um, it's a little more, um, you know, the, I think the, the CIO that we may be trying to reach it might be on LinkedIn, but more likely not on Facebook, and, or certainly not active publicly on Facebook. And so we do, we do take that into consideration as we push the different content out. Um, so again, going back to the journalists, um, you know, we know that uh, their reputations are important to them and they're important to us. I talked a little bit about that, to have a little bit of arm's length. Um, uh, you know, are, they, are the story they, they tell incredible? Because we don't want them to be shills and they do not want to be shills. And so we want to make very clear that uh, that's, that's what we want to do, so we want to be transparent about that. Um, but why journalists want to write for the network? Um, you know, many reasons. Uh, we're awesome. Um, you know, it's, that's where that's where everything's moving. Um, and then, as I stated earlier, you know, hey, they got bought out by whoever. You know, they're, 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 they've got many years of experience, and um, they're now freelancing their data. And so, hey, we're, we're trying to uh, help with that market. Um, what what you're going to hear from now is um, one of our writers, Steve Wildstrom, uh, who, who wrote. For about 25 years uh, for Business Week, but was in journalism for about 40 years, and um, it's about four minutes, and so it might be a little long if it, if it wanes. I'll, I'll stop it, but I think it'd be important to kind of hear his perspective about writing for Business Week versus writing for us and how he approaches it. And then um, at the end, he talks about um, where you think, what he thinks the state of journalism actually is, which is positive. Um, but the first part is about his writing, uh, and the second part is about his. Um, is uh, the state of journalism and his opinion. And uh, if we don't go through all this, if I see uh, uh, heads nodding, uh, uh, UT will have this and you can watch it in its entirety. And he did this on his laptop, obviously, so it's not like The biggest difference between the writing the column I used to write for Business Week and the writing I've been doing for Cisco is that Cisco is an enterprise and infrastructure company. They are interested in pieces on the subjects they care about corporately. So the result is that instead of writing primarily for a consumer audience and a business end user audience, I'm writing a lot more about infrastructure and enterprise subjects than I ever would have in my days at business work. Now that said, uh, I found writing for Cisco on the whole to be a, a very happy experience. Um, we talk in advance about what subjects I'm going to be writing about, and I sometimes find that a little restrictive because they're only interested in what they're interested in. But in terms of the copy itself, in terms of what I say, um, I have had absolutely no interference. Uh, they, they edit the stuff very lightly. And on the whole, I found you know corporate writing to be quite a good experience. I think the future of journalism is reasonably bright. Uh, I don't think the future of newspapers is particularly bright, at least not in, in print form. Uh, I think you know the economics of print, whether we're talking about newspapers or magazines, is uh, grim. 
because the economics are terrible and they're never going to get any better. Uh, postage isn't getting cheaper, paper isn't getting cheaper, printing isn't getting any cheaper, uh, whereas electronic distribution is cheap and will get even cheaper. Uh, I think the key for journalists, are, I think there are really a couple of keys for, for journalists. One is everyone is going to have to become a lot more entrepreneurial. Um, you know, I spent virtually all, I was in the, the print journalism business for uh, 40 odd years. Um, and I spent the great bulk of that with one employer. Uh, that's not going to happen anymore. Uh, it's not happening now, and I don't think it's going to happen in the future. Uh, I think a lot more people are going to be doing contract work called Freelance College of Life. Uh, the main, there's lots of work out there right now. The main problem is that, that the rates are often not very good. Uh, the other thing is the nature of what we as journalists write has to change. Uh, the bulk of journalism for most of its existence, uh, certainly for most of the 20th and first part of the 21st century, has been just sort of chronicling events. Uh, the world doesn't need many chroniclers anymore. People can follow events firsthand. They see video you know, in almost real time. Uh, they get real time news. They don't need journalists to tell them what happened. What they need journalists to do is to make sense out of what's happening. And I think that will force journalists to become much more analytical. Uh, they're going to have to be broader and they're going to have to be deeper. They're going to have to know more about the subjects they're covering. Uh, it's, it's really a, a different world, but I think it will be a good one in the long run. So happy now uh, to end with. And so the disclaimer that we, we put on our, our stories, it, it, it gives us a little protection and the journalists a little protection, we, we hope, and that's the way it was designed, but also the audience to say that, you know, hey, this, this isn't, you know, shill them. You know, we, we do hope that, you know, with these goals in mind, we're writing the topics that we care about because we're paying for it. Um, but we, we, we're, this isn't necessarily our point of view. It's just to, 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 to educate, um, to try to get some conversation going, um, and to participate in conversations that are already happening. So hopefully, um, you know, the, the, the journalists who join us, uh, this gives them that arm's length uh, confidence as well as us that, you know, they're producing, but we're not necessarily agreeing with everything they're saying. I think that's important uh, for, for the audience. Um, here's a, some of the contributors, and, and uh, I probably should have started with what the site's uh, URL is so that you can go uh, immediately and bookmark it and start subscribing to our, our RSSs. Um, but it's, it's just newsroom.cisco.com um, or the network.cisco.com. Um, but there you'll, you'll see what it's about. Um, you know, here's some of the contributors you can see from the New York Times and, and Bloomberg and Business Week and Forbes and Night the Business Report. Uh, we act, also have a couple professors here uh, contributing. Um, so keep that in mind, professors, uh, because um, you know we're we're going after the influencer audience, and, and certainly uh, as as uh, in, the, in the comms world, I care about media, obviously. Um, but you know academics are also influencers, and so we want their audiences to pay attention to them and what they're saying and for us to get some credit there as well. So we brought journalists in, hopefully, uh, because their colleagues still like them or are interested in what they're doing and that might get some of those important eyeballs. And I can tell you, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit, that we've, we've been ripped off, um, which we love. Um, sometimes with citations, sometimes not. Um, sometimes nearly verbatim, and so, uh, which isn't good, obviously, uh, for the journalists uh, in uh, who may do that, but that's happened, and that's okay, because it shows that they're watching us, and it shows that um, you know we are having some influence there. Um, I put this slide in here uh, because, uh, believe it or not, the most popular content prior uh, to the changeover uh, were press releases and our executive bios. And so what we wanted to do is wrap content around the content that people are already going to and try to push that to them. And so they're going to bios, we're going to give them a lot more content. And so what we've done is we've targeted content that the executive is either responsible for uh, in their group, um, in their division, et cetera, as well as Twitter feeds, and then make all this social plugins so you can see the community that's engaging there. And, and it's, you know, the RSS 
feed, so it's not manual. We also have a content hole if they want to use it to put their own content in as, uh, there as well. Uh, but it's about obviously trying to pull them into the other content. They care about our executive, they may care about the content around that executive. So, um, I mentioned some people who have taken our stuff, either in written, uh, taken it from data, uh, or translated it into uh, Russian, um, or, uh, you know, engaged with us in, in, in another way. And the other thing that, that you know, is, it seems minor, but for us it's actually pretty, pretty big, is we work with Google um, to have our contributed content be treated as news, um, because they do not crawl corporate newsrooms, believe it or not, that they, they don't think that content's important to, to, to audiences as far as serving it up as news. And, and so the journalists' uh, pieces are uh, go into the, the news feed um, if you care uh, about alerts and all those different things. And so we did work that, that they looked at the content and said, yeah, this is, this is journalism, this is reporting, it's not shelling. Um, and so that's, that's obviously given us a step of some credibility. It certainly helps the, 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 the writers and it helps us in the environment to say that hey, this is independent, good, good reporting. Um, the, the contents that, that we're doing are obviously corporate focused, but um, we're trying again not to do that, that rah rah Cisco stuff um, because people don't want it. I don't want it. And I, I work there. And, and so, you know, some of the things we've worked on just to give you a sense of the storytelling and the things that uh, we look for and the ideas and the creativity and the production, um, you know, and, and tens of thousands, uh, approaching hundreds of thousands of dollars now all in. Uh, we did a poetry series last summer uh, where we went to the Bowery Theater and commissioned uh, these, these uh, slam poets to write poetry on the impact of technology, um, education, healthcare, stuff like that, to try to reach some audiences that might not ordinarily be reached. And, you know, did that make a purchasing decision for Cisco? Maybe not, probably not, but it may have reached some new audience to say that, hey, this sort of technology is important. It does change lives, it is innovative, and it, it's, it's, it's something that you need to pay a little attention to. For people who don't pay attention to technology, try to reach them. Um, the series we're in the middle of now, uh, we sent uh, one of my, my colleagues, who's a former Forbes reporter, who's the, who manages all written uh, content, to Korea to do a uh, video series. Uh, she, she went with a crew to do a video series on Sando City which is a, a city that's being built from the ground up. And so we were basically, the concept was to treat it as a documentary. Um, to have, we have about nine episodes, I think we're, tomorrow's maybe the fourth episode coming out, third, fourth, I think fourth, um, to tell a story about what it's like if you were gonna build um, from the ground up. Certainly the technology is involved in doing that, that's what we care about. But, you know, from healthcare, from education, from life, from everything, and. Believe it or not, there are dozens, uh, approaching hundreds of new cities being built that obviously we want to sell our gear to, obviously. But the concept of what living and life is going to be like in the future with embedded technology, because obviously um, if it's not fitted, it's going to be retrofitted. It's going to be technical or really trade stories. We're trying to tell trend stories. We're trying to say, here's what's happening in the world, you know, certainly with the subtext of the technology impact on the world. I mean, it's very interesting uh, to watch how um, the, the stories uh, perform, um, even on social media, and, and what is kind of as as it's as it's placed to kind of watch it and to, to go all over. And it's you know we get phenomenal kind of activity and results around anything we do in Africa. Um, and so anything we do with Africa, people eat up, and they really want to share it because there's just not a lot of stuff out there on Africa. And we have a reporter uh, based in Barcelona who has a penchant for Africa and has a lot of good contacts in there, so he does a lot of content on Africa, and it does very, very well because there's not a lot of information out there about what's happening in technology. And so, you know, we do, you know, you want more of that? Okay, here you go. And, and so we, we can guide it like that. But from the, from the trade side, we hope to not be in the weeds and not be technical, not be very broken. We hope to broaden it so that a story is a story to a story. Um, and so that, uh, you know, you follow a person and their impact you know, or their business 
in this in this country. The, the thing that I didn't mention, uh, the series that we're getting ready to, that we're getting ready to start, um, is we're going to go to 12 different countries um, and follow someone throughout the day about how they use technology. And so, um, you know, in Russia and Spain and Italy and our top Big 12 markets, and there's going to be similarities. There's going to be differences, obviously. But uh, you know, oh shocker, everything they do is connected to the network. You know, they can't access, they can't communicate if they don't have Cisco gear, um, which bully for us, uh, you know, hopefully they use more and more so, the service providers have to buy more of it. But we want to demonstrate at some level that, you know, there is a baseline that's getting higher and higher. And we've done some studies with, um, with college students um, where they said um, they would rather have their smartphone than a car, uh, than extra money, um, and maybe you guys maybe disagree with that, um, but this was a global survey, and that was the most important thing uh, in their life. Um, and um, it's called the Connected Life um, um, <coughs> Study. And, you know, to, to show that level of importance, uh, you know, essentially we're trying to reach the CIO out there in the enterprise, or with the search provider, say, hey, this is only getting bigger. You know, you've got to prepare for this. This is normal, man. This is, this is not going away, so certainly that's those are the stories we're trying to tell. Follow up? I just quick follow because I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to sort of picture, you know, uh, this, the network in the way it's how all sorts of communications that professionals do. And uh, I'm trying to, it, to me it's like a mix of establishing thought leadership, which people have done, and also generate human interest stories, like we're talking about, but also there's internal engagement aspect to this, which and people have done, but they're all siloed in some ways. But you're just kind of combining. There's a one platform hitting all these three. Am I characterizing this? I think that that's fair. I mean, like I said, we have a lot of different audiences um, that we're trying to reach. Some we reach well, some we don't. Um, but essentially, you know, you know, since we're in corporate communications, the audiences we own are the analysts, the investors, the media, the employees. I mean, those are the four real critical audiences for us. And so, essentially. If we can reach them with one platform, one mechanism, and a consistent storytelling um, to get them interested in the things that we care about, um, and get and again, it's a tool, which hopefully, at, at its worst, for the AR person to reach out to their analyst and say, "Hey, thought you might be interested in this. You know, this is actually a pretty cool story that maybe you want to maybe take a look at, and maybe this is a trend that you should be you should be following." And so it's, it's hopefully at its worst it's a tool for that, but at some level it is to try to raise the level of awareness about what is happening in the world uh, around technology trends and how it's, uh, its impact on work, live, play, and learn, you know, all those things that uh, our little tagline says. So, yeah. How's the perception of Cisco evolved amongst, as a company and a brand, amongst the key audiences? Well, that's a difficult question because the point in time right now, we just had uh, some layoffs last summer, unfortunately, and so that's, that's a business performance issue. Um, and so our reputation right now, um, after three really good quarters uh, uh, financially, uh, we just reported last week, is better. Um, but obviously the business impacts the brand. And so the brand, I mean, we're one of the top you know, brands in the world. Um, we've, we've gotten as high as, in a brand study, I don't know, call it 17, I don't know, you know, right between Clorox and BMW or somewhere in there. So it's a well-recognized brand, and we certainly, that's one of the measurements we look at holistically from all our communications and marketing efforts. Um, point in time right now, I think uh, you have to say we're, we're probably below. Um, but hopefully it has the, the, in, the, the launch of the network doesn't impact negatively our brand. Um, but um, I know that wasn't your question, but you know, it, it, it's you know essentially what I would what I would highlight for you is something one of our executives told an employee. We have these um, employee meetings uh, which are global, they're video cast, um, and so but you can engage uh, you know real time uh, through through Jabber, through our chat rooms, and so we have executives staffing these when our CEO or CFO are, are, are talking to employees, giving them updates or direction or here's what we're doing. That's how we manage uh, employee communications. And this employee, this was back last summer, we were just getting hammered. You know, hey, your CEO needs to leave. You know, this company is done. You guys are, you know, just messed it up and, 
you know, we were still, you know, doing ten billion dollars in revenue with, you know, sixty percent margins and four billion in profit, but we're, you know, we're deadbeats. And so, an employee uh, asked on um, the, the question <coughs> directly, you know, what as employees can we do to stop, you know, this media beating us up and you know to all these audiences? And his response was, drive revenue and drive profit. You know, which is the answer to all of this. I mean, and so the brand is, is, is only as good as your business. Um, and if your business isn't going well, your brand's not going well. So I hope that kind of gave you flavor. Yep. Sir, um, the, the journalists that we've talked about working with, for the most part, these are established brands. Right? These are for, and that's one of the reasons why you're working with them. They have their own brands. What advice would you have for some of the younger journalists in the room, the aspiring journalists, the aspiring corporate journalists? who don't yet have their own brands, who find this kind of work they're willing to What would the path be? I gotta tell you, I mean, video, 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 video. I mean, if you can tell a story on video uh, and, and have your, I've seen like probably 60,000 max since I've been here today, you know, which you can do it right there. I mean, if you can, um, you know, tell a story a compelling story uh, with video in two minutes. That's a skill that not very many people have, and it's a skill that we really, 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 really want. And I think that, that uh, you know, you could have heard from me about what Steve Wildstrom says about his interactions, but hearing from him is is much more, you know, compelling um, because I'm not characterizing his words, and I think you know, from a transparency. Um, the storytelling uh, in video is, is is critical, and so I think those skills are you know paramount. <coughs> I mean, because we would gobble those skills up, and we actually you know have been looking uh, in, in that area, and so um, that that's primary. But again, you know, I think going to what Wallace said is you know there's got to be you know chronicling is one thing, analysis is another, and the skills that it takes for those. And I think that um, you know that's kind of you know why we're here and, and why. Yeah, students are learning here because you've got to figure that out. So be an analytical visual storytelling. Right. Yes. So it sounds like you take care to be transparent about this, which feels important. But to me, having on Google News complicates things. So was that hard to talk into it? And are other corporate brands under news on Google News? So they initially said no um, because they took a look at the site and they're like, ah, oh, this is. You know, your news releases, I mean, it's not credible. I mean, we're like, no, 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 wait a second. It's this feed, it's these journalists, it's this type of content that we're talking about. They went back and looked at it, and they're like, you're right. This is, this isn't, you know, a brochure for your company. This is actual, um, you know, this is a story. This is reporting. And so, are other companies doing that? Um, you know, Intel is doing something with a bit of a, twist of what we're doing. They, they have a site called the Intel Free Press, and the free meaning, please, people, take this. Theirs is really Intel-focused. Theirs is going inside a, a, you know, a, a chip fab and talking to you know, how things are made, which we do some of that content, but that's not the content that we're asking people to go and, and share and engage in. It's more of the, if you will, um, you know, professional content uh, from our from our journalists that, that, that we want. So the treatment of such is, you know, I hear I hear the the subtext of your question, and um, you know, I think it's 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 evolving I mean, because it's it's kind of like you know, is our business model because we sell routers um, not the business model that that journalism uh, should should have um, and. You know, our ads, the only thing that, you know, are credible to support journalism. And um, I think that, you know, we all know that, you know, from watching the LA Times or, or watching, you know, the San Jose Mercury News or watching all of these these companies just, you know, whack and whack and whack and whack, you know, we've got to be another model. And, and not that we're saying, hey, we're, this is a newsroom and, you know, let's let we're journalists, and this is what we do. And I'm not I'm not not saying that at all. But you know, there is still room for a good story, um, um, regardless if it's uh, you know if you have a masthead that, that is supported by ads. But if I could just follow up, with that. everything you've said is very interesting. To me, the part that doesn't hang together is this: we're not competing with news, with news. We're not news. We're not 
But then on the other hand, you said we're just we're telling good stories and the world needs us. And I would argue that if you're on Google News, you are well, I mean, the way I look at it, you know, wearing my PR hat is if the story's too good, I'm going to pitch it. I'd rather have someone else tell it. I don't want to tell it myself. And so there's stories that aren't being told that, that we, in the volume that we want told, um, on the topics we want told on. And so we're doing that ourselves. And, and so there's, there's not an appetite. I mean, there is the, you know, what's going on today? You know, give me, give me the data and I'll put it right back out. And I'm going to post 15 times a day. And that's going to run traffic and that's going to drive the metrics and page views and all that stuff. You know, that's not what we're, what we're doing for. And there's less, you know, long form journals. And our stories aren't long to begin with. I mean, you know, they're maybe 700 words max. I mean, and some, most of them are even shorter than that. Um, but we're not getting what we need from journalists. Uh, and so we're doing it ourselves. Yes? So do you think it's a corporate culture thing? What, why Intel's more like a bunch of newsletters on their free press and you guys are more like a news organization? Is I think it's all experimentation. I mean, I think, you know, they probably sold it by saying, hey, it's going to be Intel, Intel, Intel. And I didn't sell it at all. We just did it. Uh, and so I think that's, that has to do with culture a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, but, but I said it's all we're learning as we go. And we'll adjust, and you know, give the people what they want, and we do more of that. Uh, but you know, it, it's going to evolve. I have no doubt. What we're doing now, you know, will will change, um, and we'll throw some things in there that, that work, uh, and throw some thing, things there that, that don't work. Sir, you you mentioned. Uh, I want to ask you a little more about your editorial process. I mean, you mentioned public radio, but in public radio, there there is a like an editorial firewall. That's in, Alvin office, uh, senior editors, and by the time often they don't even know who's funded, right? So there is not that sort of firewall. But obviously, credibility and transparency are really important to you, and otherwise, you maybe wouldn't be able to attract these journalists. So, what sort of, would you try to build some sort of internal firewall so that these guys, I mean, uh, your, your guy was explaining that you didn't feel one sentence was done, and there was much interference, but do you have that as a policy? We're not going to kill stories if you don't kill the story. I, I'm curious to know more about that, and also as a follow-up, just how the poetry thing works. I mean, if, what sort of, I mean, are there, is there someone who judges the poetry who's, you know, with your company? I, that, that was really curious. Um, so our first part, uh, the, the firewall essentially is the, the journalists don't talk to anybody but us. Um, and so we do the vetting on topics and, you yeah, know, this is good, that's not good. So th there's a little bit of, you know, the PR person picking up the call and say, Steve, it'd be so great if you wrote a story about, about this and here's what I want you to say, here's how to say it, here's what you can talk to. There, there, there's none of that, obviously. Um, and so uh, that's about as far as it goes. <coughs> the anecdote that I would, would give you here is that about, Three years ago, I went into a major publication, major, big name, bold name publication, um, to, to chat with uh, some editors. Um, afterwards, after we were talking about what Cisco's interested in, what the publication's interested in, uh, they said, you know what? We'd love to cover you guys, but you know we just don't have the bandwidth. Um, however, if you were to sponsor a section on our website, that was about innovation or yada yada, we would cover you a lot more. And so I'm just telling you where the state of affairs are, and that was three years ago. And so that was a that was a that was a slam in the face. I almost puked. I mean, um, and so not something that you would think I mean, this is this is not a publisher. This isn't this is a journalist uh, telling me this. And and so um, you know I think that the the, the there's a lot of bleeding going on, uh, and, and you know, again, I'm not, again, I'm not pretending to be a journalist or a news person. I'm not. We're, you know, trying to tell good corporate stories that support the corporation, uh, but hopefully there's some credibility behind uh, behind the journalists that, that get to tell those stories, um, and there's an arm's length that, that allow them to do that. Um, Have you ever killed a story once you came in? You know, I, I was. I think we did that once, and I can't remember why. Um, and it may have been uh, because we had 
a product coming out and we weren't ready for the store or something. I can't remember the, the topic, but I think there has been one. But yes, so but on yeah, rare, rare occasions. And the second part the poetry. Yeah, the poetry. I mean that was that was a brainstorm. It was like, you know, hey, what can we do? This creative the kind and then obviously we went back and forth with the poets on trying on topics and, and they wrote the poetry and then and we filmed it in the Bowery Poetry Club. But again, you know, trying to tell stories in different ways, um, trying to be creative, trying to reach people. And that, that series actually is a finalist for the Webby Award. And so was it well watched? The first one was. Um, were the rest of them maybe not? But if we can get some recognition and slowly build on our credibility that there is some interesting content, then, then that's obviously what we're, we're doing one step at a time. What rhymes with router? <laughs> <laughs> Slam poetry, right? It's not all, it's not all rhyming. Not couplets. Yes. Um, I was wondering, what percent of the time are you pitching stories you want told to journalists or to them pitching stories that they want to tell? And then my second question would be, um, what other organizations are there that is embracing this model particularly well besides, you know, ones in your industry? Is it a popular phenomenon? And um, first question is percentage pitch. Uh, I would say. I think we'd like to give them more stories. Um, we don't have that pipeline necessarily built internally yet. I mean, it is a collaborative. They come to us more um, and, and because they know the topics we're interested in. They say, "How about this?" Um, but we want. We would. The, the preference, I think, would be to say, "Hey, it'd be great to get stories, you know, in this topic. This would be really cool." And we haven't really built that as well. So they come to us. Um, and um, the second part of your question, sorry. And just other organizations. Uh, or, well, I think you've heard here. I mean, people are talking about um, you know building their own pipes, and you know, as I was saying uh, before we started, you know, it's, it's like you know the media. You know, if you have to go through them, um, sometimes you're not going to be able to tell the story. But if you can go straight to the people you want to reach, um, then you know, hey, that's what you know Ronald Reagan did. He's like, yeah, I don't have to deal with tires. So I'm going to go straight on TV. And, just talk straight to the people. And, and, and essentially, that's what, uh, at some small level, we're trying to do. And I think more people, uh, because of the social techno technologies that are out there, you can do that. You can target and you can build audiences. And so um, I think more and more, I, I've had plenty of conversations with companies about this, about this model. Um, I've talked to uh, PR firms who were talking to their clients about doing this model. Um, and I don't watch the space that closely, but you know. Uh, maybe I should, but there are more certainly talks, and I think more more are launching. But um, I think it's 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 going to get probably bigger. A great example is MLB.com. Any baseball fans? Yeah. Check out MLB.com. Pure corporate journalism, and at the bottom of every story, it will say, "Mr. X is a reporter, an independent reporter, paid by MLB, but we do not in any way interfere with the story." Great coverage of baseball, positive and negative. And we do the same thing, except we write about routers, not, you know. <laughs> Similar. <coughs> Nissan's launching one here. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. So I just wanted to follow on your point about um, uh, sort of journalism that exists sort of in a silo and separate from all these things and then it worked for large publications that are part of conglomerates that own other interests and it's very dicey when you try to cover uh, an industry uh, that your publisher is also involved in. Um, <clears throat> but what you were describing in terms of social media and the sort of two tenets that you put out the sort of no-go areas, which is don't write about our competitors and don't, you know, take a swipe at this company. But when you say that you're really trying to sort of start a conversation, one of the great things about social media is you don't know where that conversation is going to go. Right. So uh, do you have any policy whereby you would kind of step in down the road? Has this been institutionalized yet, or has it just not come up yet? I mean, McDonald's tried to start a social media policy recently and went pay, pay one, um, and it had to sort of pull it back. Uh, our social media policy, as I, I was telling uh, your colleague here, is uh, it's online. We, we are for our employees, so you can go to SlideShare, you can go to Scribd, and it's posted. And it's, uh, here's exactly what we expect from employees. Um, and it's in our code of business conduct. Um, you have to sign off on it every, uh, every year. But essentially, it's, it, you know, at its highest level to be smart. We're a smart company, we want to be smart, you know, and 
Online rules and offline rules are exactly the same as far as engagement. If you're not if you're not in PR, don't go on social media and start talking to reporters. You know, and, and so there there are some rules there. But I, you know, I think that the crux of all this is that everything's changing. Everything from how stories are told to how engagements happen to how you target to, and, and the technology is getting better and better. It's only going to get better. The measurements can get better. And you know, there's going to be hyper targeting. And I think you know, going back to, to days in, in Washington. Uh, doing a press release when you had an audience, you know, you put it on the wire, and it's, that's fantastic. But your audience was one person, um, and so essentially, that is taking that concept and doing a mm -hmm. little bit, uh, doing a little bit more, and learning how to do that. Well, my question is a little different. Like, if you have an article about uh, what I'm saying is what might be interpreted as being good or bad for the company is really open to interpretation. Uh, and as those things foster conversations, the conversations can go in directions that might make the company feel uncomfortable. Perhaps there's something about you know Cisco getting out of consumer electronics uh, that somebody wrote an article that you know then sort of has a life of its own. Have you ever had to step in? Would you ever see a, a moment when you might have to step in to sort of stop a conversation? And start? Um, no, I mean we haven't. And I think the one thing that we usually do, and I think that social media allows us to do, is to give our point of view. And people can take it or leave it, but it is our point of view. And you can say it's you know spin or it's crass or you can do whatever you want to do it. But this is what we have to say. And I think the other thing about starting conversations is very very hard. Um, you participate in ones that are already happening more normally, obviously. And so uh, I think that this notion of us trying to, to build something it's all hit or miss, and starting something is very very difficult. Um, but we hope to become a voice. Um, in the conversation uh, that's credible based on our track record and based on the, the, the transparency that we hope to offer to that, that conversation that may be happening. So that's what I'd say. Great. Well, John, thank you very much.